Hi again students, welcome to ITTV's lesson of Biology Form 4. We are in Chapter 2. Still remember that previously we already had a look on cell organization in animals. Still remember those muscle tissues, those connective tissues such as bone, blood, lymph. Very good. If you are still there, let's carry on now to the world of plants. Well, you see, plants also consist of cells because they are also living things. And they are multicellular organisms as well, right? Now, we have been living with plants for a long, long, long time in this planet. And we are very dependent towards them. Now, let's get to understand more about the plant. And by knowing the types of cells that are involved in a plant, it will make us to better appreciate them and better understand them. Now, students, plants too have organs and systems. Don't you think so? Yes. But it's just that we were never sure that the plant had some organs and structures. So today, what we're going to see is we're going to delve deeper into the idea of plant cell organization and systems and or even organs found in the plant. For an example, let me say the flower. The flower is actually a reproductive organ of the plant. Did you know that? Yes. Back when you were in Form 3, you have learned about that. Sexual reproduction in plant involves the, yes, the flowers. So now, let's take a look at the tissues that are found in the plant. Let's take a look. There are two main types of plant tissue, and they are known as meristematic tissue and permanent tissue. First, let's see these words called meristematic tissue. Now, it's very important for you to remember this meristematic tissue. Why? Because the meristems of a plant are very important for the growth of the plant. So till when you are in Form 5, you'll be learning more and more about plants. And almost in every chapter, from approximately chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, in Form 4, and all the way in all the chapters throughout your Form 5, there will be a component of plant investigation. So you'll be learning more and more about plants. And most students, we don't like about it. We don't like these plants because we are not very familiar with them. For all we know, we just pour water and have some fertilizer and they grow. If they bear some fruit, we pluck the fruit we eat. And if they bear some flowers, we just pluck the flowers and put it on our ties or our foreheads or anywhere else, right? They are decorative organisms. We have never seen them as a living thing side by side with us. So now let's take a look at meristematic tissue. The meristem tissues consists of small cells which have thin cell walls, large nuclei, a dense cytoplasm, and most importantly, there are no vacuoles. The meristem tissues are young and actively dividing cells that do not undergo cell differentiation. Now students, what is this cell differentiation? Cell differentiation is another word for cell specialization. Now, that happens only when a cell or a certain group of cells that form a tissue needs to carry out a specific function. For example, we all know that the xylem transports water, right? Now a xylem is already a correct differentiated cell. So before it is being differentiated, they have to have been a meristem tissue first. So every part of the plant, one time or another, started off as a meristem tissue. And as they keep growing, only then they will start forming the xylems and the phloems that you know. Okay, let's carry on. Meristem tissues are found at the tip of the roots and at the buds of shoots. They are known as the apical meristem. The cells undergo mitotic cell division to increase the number of cells for plant growth. Now, what is this mitotic cell division? Now, it is known as mitosis. Now, in during mitosis, the plant cells each cell would divide into two cells and therefore allows the cell to multiply you get it good next the lateral meristems or cambium are found in the peripheral areas of the stem and roots they are responsible for secondary growth to increase the diameter of the stem and the roots itself let's take a look at a diagram involving the apical meristem the diagram on your left is a diagram of the shoot can you see, approximately the middle of the shoot consists entirely of apical meristems. And on the right, you have the root tip. And at the ends of the root, 
you will also find the same epical meristem. Now students, think and see for one moment. Why is it at the shoot tip and the root tip do we need this apical meristem? Because this is where the plant grows. Where do you think the plant grows from? From the center of the bark, is it? No, they will always grow on the tips, the shoot tip and the root tip. This is where they grow. So this will allow them to keep growing upwards and downwards. Get it? So now these apical meristems are important for what? Yes, they are important for the plant to gain height. Okay, let's continue. You can also see further diagrams of the apical meristem here. As we saw previously, you already know that there are two types of tissues. One is meristematic tissue and the other are permanent tissues. Now, the most of the amount of tissues found in the cells or the plants can be found in permanent tissue stage. All right, so let's check out one by one. Permanent tissues are major tissues that have either undergone differentiation or they are undergoing differentiation. There are three types of permanent tissue. There are three types of permanent tissue. One, the epidermal tissue. Two, ground tissue. And third, the vascular tissues. So once again, students, you've got to remember this. There are how many types of permanent tissue? Three, epidermal tissue, ground tissue, and vascular tissue. Epidermal, ground and vascular. Memorize this, okay? You've got to memorize this. Next. All these tissues have specific functions in a plant. So let's take a look at the epidermal tissues. Now, as you already know, epidermal means the skin. Now, these are the outermost layer that covers the stems, leaves and roots of all young plants. Most of the epithelial cells are flat and have large vacuoles. The walls of these epithelial cells that are exposed to air are covered with cuticle which is a layer of waxy waterproof coating. The cuticle is to reduce water loss from evaporation and this protects the plant from mechanical injury and also prevents the invasion of microorganisms that cause disease. Now students, have you experienced the cuticle before this? Say for example you had an apple. Now just before biting into the apple, just take edge of a knife. Okay. Now, if you take the edge of the knife, all you need to do is gently scrape on the surface of the apple. Now, as you gently scrape on the surface, you will see a white colored powder being formed. Now, that white color powder is the cuticle. Now, what is the cuticle actually? It is wax, which is a group of fats, right? That means lipids are stored on the surface of all these plants. Get it? They prevent water loss from happening and they also prevent invasion from external pathogens. The epidermal cells of the roots have long projections called root hairs. This is to increase the surface area for water and mineral absorption. Guard cells are found in the leaves. They are specialized epidermal cells containing chloroplasts. These guard cells control the opening and the closing of the stomata. Next, we have ground tissues. There are three types of ground tissues. Parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Now, I know it might sound a bit more funny, but you've got to still remember the names and the spellings for each of these cells. And pay attention because after this, we will be describing each characteristic of each of the cells. It's very important for you to know because it is tested in your exams. So once again, how many ground tissues do we have? Three. Parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Just remember them in that same order. Parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Very good. These tissues form the bulk of the plant, which means they are found most in the plant. This is an example of a parenchyma tissue. Now, I want you to pay attention to the thin cell walls that you can observe. Can you see? Good. Next, I want you to observe the large vacuoles. Now get it into your system, okay? Parenchyma tissues have thin cell walls and they have large vacuoles. Now then, question to you. Why do parenchyma cells have large vacuoles? What's the function? Let's say in your house, you have a very large room that is empty and everybody has a room in your house, but then you have an extra room which is large and which is empty. What would you use that room for? What would you use the room for? Yeah, obviously you would store all your stuff in that room. 
So let's say you've got items or furniture that you're not using, you'll just take a bulk of them and dump it into that room and shut the door, right? So what is space necessary for? To store, right? Now, remember that, let's carry on. The cells of these parenchyma tissues have thin walls and large vacuoles and are loosely packed with spaces between them. Do you see? There are large vacuoles and there are spaces. The cells are least specialized and can be found in all the organs of the plant. The cells store sugar and starch synthesized from photosynthesis. Students, remember I told you empty spaces are for what? Yes, act as a storage facility. So can I say that the parenchyma cells or parenchyma tissue act as a storage facility for the plant? Yes, correct. Let's continue. The palisade mesophyll cells and spongy mesophyll cells in the leaves contain chloroplasts and are specialized cells to carry out photosynthesis. The parenchyma tissues give support and shape to the plants. If you take a look, most cells in the plant will provide support for the plant. So you might not be wrong if you were just to guess mm, that cell is for support. I don't think you will go wrong because most of them do that function. Okay? So remember, parenchyma, colonchyma and all the sclerenchyma, all three of them, will eventually be used for support. But what is special about the parenchyma? Put it into your head. What is it? Storage of starch and glucose, which is made up from photosynthesis. Very good. Now, if you would think back, okay, think back in our previous lessons that we have learned, I have given you a cross section of the leaf. Do you still remember that? Good. Now, in that cross section, we took a look at about two different groups of cells. One was called spongy mesophyll and the other was a mesophyll palisade. Awesome. So now, the mesophyll palisade is the one that we are discussing right now. Remember, the mesophyll palisades were elongated, correct? When they were elongated, they had small vacuole which could keep a lot of chloroplast inside them. Now, now you understand? Parenchyma cells act as a storage, right? In that example, the parenchyma stored a lot of chloroplast and starch. Let's carry on, okay? The next tissue that we're going to take a look is the colonchyma tissue. Now guys, pay attention to this diagram of the colonchyma tissue. Can you see that each cell has a very, very thick cell wall? Okay, now observe this and always remember that in exams, you will be asked to identify the types of cells. So once again, let's recap, okay? Now we're doing this together, you and me together, all right? Now, the first type of ground tissue was parenchyma. The second was colonchyma. Now, parenchyma tissues had large space in between them. They had a large vacuole. Now, in colonchyma tissues, you have got a very thick wall. Can you see? So, large spaces, parenchyma, thick cell wall, colonchyma. Now, I want you to guess, what is the function of the colonchyma? If it has a thick wall, obviously it is to support the plant. Good. Let's see if our guess is right. These colonchyma tissues consist of elongated polygonal cells with uneven thickened cell walls, especially at the corners. The cell walls are thickened by cellulose and pectin. These make the cells strong and flexible. Colonchyma tissue also provides support to non-woody or herbaceous plants, young stems and petioles. Now what are these herbaceous plants? Herbaceous plants are those little fellas, the little plants that you find in pots all around your house. Now, there was another word there that you probably didn't understand. Petioles, right? What are petioles? Now, let's take a look at this. Now, say for example, I have this artificial flower here. Now, this artificial plant has got flowers and it's got buds on the end. It also has leaves. Now this is a, a basic structure of a herbaceous plant. Now check out in the center. Check out the center. Here in the center we have a non-woody stem. And the leaves, flowers and buds are all connected to the non-woody stem following these structures. Now these structures that you find here, these are the petioles. So the petioles link the bud, the flower, and the leaf to the stem. 
Get it? So these are the petioles of the plant. So students, the next time when you go and pluck a flower or you pluck a leaf, all right? So remember, you are actually breaking off its petioles. It'll be quite funny, try it with your friends. Let's carry on then to the next form of tissue. Now guys, pay attention to the sclerenchyma tissues. Wow, they look even stronger than the colenchyma tissues, right? Why? Because they have got a set of cell walls. Can you see there is a primary cell wall and a secondary cell wall? Can you see that the cell wall is fortified and it is very, very strong? So once again, can you guess, students? Once again, guess. What is the function of the sclerenchyma? You got it, spot on, support. If there's lots of cell walls, obviously it's becoming stronger, okay? So sclerenchyma tissues are cells which have cell walls which are uniformly thickened by lignin. These cells are more rigid than the colenchyma tissue. Most of the cells are dead cells when they reach maturity. They support and strengthen the mature regions of the plant. You see, students, the mature region of the plants will usually be much more heavier than the immature regions because the shoots have a very light leaf, okay? They're very young, they're very light, they don't have much cells in them. But as they keep growing, they become more specialized and eventually there'll be water being carried through it, there'll be food being carried through it. So you need more support. Therefore, these clinical climate tissues will give that support. Now, what is this thing called lignin? Lignin is a compound that the plant will make itself and it will help to fortify the cell. Fortify means to make it stronger, all right? For example, at your homes, you have walls with concrete, right? The concrete makes your walls stronger. The plants have lignin, which makes them stronger. Now, let's carry on to vascular tissues. Now, this you might be quite familiar with. Check out this beautiful diagram of the xylem and the phloem. Now this is a cross section of the xylem and the phloem. So vascular tissues consist of xylem and phloem. You already know the function of the xylem. However, the xylem consists mainly of tracheids and xylem vessels. So when you were little, you only learned xylem. Xylem has one structure. And most of you would have thought that the xylem was a long tube, a pipe, correct? But now you know it is not. Why? Because the xylem consists of actually two parts. For now, two parts is more than good enough for you to remember. They are known as the tracheids and xylem vessels. Very good, tracheids and vessels, okay? Next, these are long tubes joined together end to end, extending from the roots right up to the shoots or the leaves. Huh? The cell walls are thickened with the lignin to provide support and mechanical strength to the plant itself. The cells of the xylem die upon maturity so can I say that the xylem consists of what kind of ground tissue? Yes, it will also have sclerenchyma tissues in them. You get it? Good. Check out this diagram of the xylem, guys. Can you see that there is a hollow tube? This hollow tube is the one that we referred to earlier as xylem vessels. They transport for us water and mineral salts in the plants from the root right up to the leaf. And if you check the xylem walls, they have lignin attached to them. This makes the xylem very, very strong. And this causes the xylem to act as a support mechanism for the plant itself. When the cytoplasm of the xylem disintegrates, it provides a hollow tube. This allows the efficient transfer of water and mineral salt from the root to all parts of the plant. Now students, ready to take a look at how the phloem looks? Let's see if it was the same as in your imagination in form three. The phloem is also not like what you have experienced before. The phloem consists of two parts. One, the sieve tube, and the other, a companion cells. Very good. Now, can you see that in the sieve tubes, there are something known as sieve plates? Now, what is a sieve? Now, have you experienced this? Your mom buys flour from the shop, okay? Any kind of flour. And then before she makes this chakro or some other delicacy from that flour or bake a cake with it, what does she do? Yes, she'll put it into a tool and she will sieve it. She will sieve it. Remember the thing that you shake, got lots of holes in the bottom and they will all drop down. Whatever that is big in size will be kept on top. Now why does the flow member sieve to you? Can't tell you now. Be patient, you are learning from five, okay? 
let's carry on. Phloems are vessels which consist of parenchyma cells, sclerites, sieve tubes and companion cells. These sieve tubes, which are mainly conducting cells of the phloem, have sieve plates with pores on them at both ends. These sieve tubes are arranged end to end to form a long continuous tube-like structure, almost like the xylem, okay? Organic substances such as carbohydrates, or we know it as starch, and amino acids synthesized in the leaves during photosynthesis are transported to storage organs and to other growing parts of the plant. So when the starch is made in the leaf, it's got to be transported up and down, all right? From the leaf, not only going straight to the root, eh? from the leaf going up and down to the growing parts of the plant. Very good. Now, as the starch is going, you know that starch can become a bit sticky and colloidal, right? So what if the starch molecules stick to one another and they clog up the phloem? That's why we have sieve tubes. Sieve tubes prevent them from coagulating or accumulating. Okay then, boys and girls. Now, since you have done so much of work already regarding plant tissue, let's do a summary of the plant tissue, all right? Let's take a look at the board. Now, students, if you would pay attention earlier, you would have already known the things that I'm going to say, but now a faster version of it, okay? Let's go. Plant tissue consists of two types of tissue, meristematic tissue and permanent tissue. Very good. Meristematic tissue are consisting of two parts. One, we know it as the apical meristem and the other is known as the lateral meristem. Now, what is this apical and lateral meristem? Apical comes from the word apex, meaning up and down. So, apical meristem will allow the plant to grow upwards and downwards. Whereas lateral meristems will allow the plant to grow sideways, to gain diameter. Now I want you to remember this. Why? Because people will ask you on what is the function of apical and lateral meristems. Once again, function of apical meristem allows plant to gain height. Function of lateral meristem allows plant to gain the diameter or thickness. So this is known as primary growth. Whereas this is known as secondary growth. Now, what are apical meristems and where can they be found? They can be found only on two locations in the plant. One is the root tip and the other the shoot tip. Whereas lateral meristems are found in the cambium. So what is the function of the cambium? You know that there is this thing known as a vascular bundle. Now the vascular bundle is divided to two regions. Now, on the center, you have the cambium. On the inside of the plant, you have a xylem. On the outside, you have a phloem. Still remember? Now, the function of the cambium is to make new xylem and new phloem. So every time the cambium produces a new xylem and a new phloem, what will happen? The old xylem and old phloem will be pushed away. Can you see? Can you see that previously the plant was only at this diameter but now it has already grown. So this is the function of the cambium to make new xylem and new phloem and allow it to gain diameter. Good? Now take a look at this. Permanent tissue, we have three types of them. Epidermal, the skin, ground tissue and vascular tissue. Now, epidermal tissue examples are root hair and guard cells. Now, these are different from other epidermal tissue. Why? Because the guard cells have specific function, the opening and the closing of the stoma. The root has a specific function. Normal roots will be found like this. These are the normal roots. But in the roots, you can find little baby roots that protrude out. Have you seen this? Yes. They protrude out gently and a little. Yes. What's the function? You can find the same structure on this side as well. Now, what is the function of these? These are root hairs. Root hairs allow a greater absorption of water. Why? Because they have a... Once again, we saw this term before this once. TSA over V. Students, what is this TSA over V? Total surface area per 
volume. If this value is high, is it good or bad? Once again, if this value is high, is it good or bad? It is good. Why? The higher the TSAOV, the greater the absorption of water, the better the plant can survive. Let's take a look at ground tissue. Ground tissue, we've got three types. Parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. Now, brief update for you. Parenchyma, what's the function? Storage, very good. Colenchyma function, support. Sclerenchyma function, support. So now it's quite easy for us to already identify. Parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. Remember in that order. And then what we will do next? Remember the function as well. Storage, support, support. Parenchyma, colenchyma, sclerenchyma. Storage, support, support. Simple. You got it already. Now, vascular tissue are two types. Xylem and phloem. This you have learned many times in your PMR days. Xylem transports water from root to the leaf. Phloem transports organic substances from the leaf to all growing parts of the plant. Easy, isn't it? You got all of it in a nutshell and right now it's in your memory. Don't forget it, okay? Now students, you can see here before you now an example of systems or organs in a plant. Let's take a look. In a plant, you have shoots, flowers, stems, buds, leaves and roots. Well, these are all organs found in the plant, okay? The leaves, the stems, the roots, the flowers and the fruits are organs of the plant. Plants have much fewer organs compared to animals, don't you think? The systems in plants are not as specialized as those found on animals. So, flowering plants, which is also known as angiosperms, have two main systems. These two systems are known as the root system and the shoot system. There is an example of many root systems that you can find. Tap root, fibrous root and adventitious root. Adventitious root can be found in sugarcane plants. The root system consists of all the roots of a plant and it's the absorptive system which absorbs water and mineral salts. Very good. They are highly branched mainly to absorb water and mineral, dissolve minerals from the soil and transport them to other parts of the plant. Root system also provides anchorage to the ground. What is anchorage? Provides support. It will grip to the ground and it will hold them steady. Okay. You can see in the shoot system now, you can find leaves, stem, if there is a fruit and sometimes a flowers. The stems and branches act as a support system for the plant to hold the leaves upright to receive maximum absorption of sunlight for photosynthesis. They also position the flowers to insects and the wind for pollination to take place. Because after pollination, fruits and seeds will be produced. So now, students, we have already taken a look at everything that is to be known in cell organization of plants. Let's give a brief summary. Then once again, as you know, we will go on to our assessment. Let's see. Organs and systems found in plants are not as complex as found in animals. As you have studied, all plants are multicellular organisms because they have all the levels of a multicellular organism. Now, what are levels of multicellular organism? They are cell becoming tissue, a group of tissue forming an organ, a group of organs form a system and systems put together will form the organism. This system or these levels can be found in all plants. So, because we have already done it, let's test ourselves whether we still remember them, okay? Let's go to our first question for the day. Herbaceous plants are plants without woody stem. Which of the following tissues give support to these plants? A. Ground tissue B. Parenchyma tissue C. Colenchyma tissue and D. Permanent tissue It's a simple question. The answer is Yes, C. Colenchyma tissue Next The meristematic tissues are always active in undergoing mitotic cell division why is this so? A. The cells of the meristem are responsible for plant growth. B. To replace the dead epidermal cells that is constantly shut off. C. To increase the diameter of the stem of the plant. D. To increase the surface area of the stem. So your answer, like all of you all guess, the answer is A. It is for growth. 
Meristemic cells are for growth. Question 3. The surface of most leaves are covered with a layer of oily or waxy layer. What is this layer known as? A. Epidermal layer B. Petioles C. Palisade layer D. Cuticle The answer is D. Cuticle Very good. Next, why is this cuticle important to the plant? To prevent the plant from invasion of microorganism. That's one. Two, to aid in the transpiration rate of the plant. Three, to protect the plant from mechanical injury. Four, to prevent excessive water loss from the plant. It's quite a hard question. You've got your pick. Let's check the answer. Answer is C, 1, 3 and 4. The cuticle is not important in the aiding of the transpiration rate. Question 5. Question 5. Why are the roots so important to the plants? 1. They form one of the systems of the plants. 2. They are responsible for the absorption of water and dissolve minerals into the plant. 3. With the root system, the plants can't topple easily. 4. All plants have roots to live. Well, the answer... C. 2 and 3. Very good. Next question. The permanent tissues of the plants are cells that have undergone differentiation or are undergoing differentiation. Name the tissues found in the permanent tissues. The answer is quite easy, isn't it? 1. Epidermal tissue 2. Ground tissue and 3. Vascular tissue So far so good. Let's check the next question. The palisade mesophyll cells and the spongy mesophyll cells of the parenchyma tissue in the leaves are specialized cells. What do they contain and what are the function to the plant? Now you've got to really recall this very well. Let's take a look at the answer now. The cells contain chloroplasts that are responsible for carrying out photosynthesis. Next question. What happens when the cells of the xylem die upon maturity? Let's see what happens to them. Answer. When the cells of the xylem die, the cytoplasm disintegrates to form hollow tubes which is efficient in the transport of water and dissolved mineral salts from the roots to the leaves. Good. Next question. What is the sexual reproductive organ of the plants and what are the structures? This answer is relatively easy. I told you in the beginning of the lesson. The sexual reproductive organ of the plant is the flower and the structures are the stamen which is the male and pistil which is the female organ. Last question for the day. What are the phloem vessels consist of and state its function in the plant? The answer. The phloem vessels consist of parenchyma cells, sclerites, sieve tubes and companion cells. Its function is to transport carbohydrates and amino acids synthesized in the leaf to be stored or to other growing parts of the plant to be used. So students, I guess you have got all the answers and I guess this was quite hard for you, quite tough for you, but we try to make it as easy as possible. Now you've got to remember, practice makes perfect. You've got to keep practicing them again and again, okay? So as we are at the end of cell organization in plants, we are almost done with the chapter. Just a little bit more to go. But unfortunately, we have to meet you again in the next lesson. So until then, thank you for viewing ITTV. This is Mr. Gary, your faithful partner. Thank you.